In February 1991, the small Gulf state of Kuwait was liberated from invading Iraqi forces seven months after they crossed the border. A multinational force quickly drove out Saddam Hussein's troops. But 11 years later, the Iraqi leader's hold on power remains unchallenged. Now, with a global action against terrorism, some are calling for a more decisive action against Saddam Hussein, bringing Kuwait back into the spotlight. But where does this leave Kuwaitis in terms of safety, security and economic prospects? We take a look next as we examine Kuwait's maturing democracy. Where the desert meets the sea. By all accounts, Kuwait shouldn't exist. It's located in one of the most demanding environments on Earth. September the 11th, 2001. In a heartbeat, the world changed. Global security came tumbling down. In Kuwait, memories of Iraq's aggression 11 years earlier were still fresh in many minds, along with the concern that September the 11th would shape public opinion of Muslims negatively. From the first minute, we all here knew and described what happened as a very evil terrorist act, which has nothing to do with any religion whatsoever, not only Islam. All Muslims, I think, real Muslims, are against this terror. And uh, we, are, uh, we, we feel uh, sympathetic to the United States. The attacks also launched a US-led effort to eradicate global terrorism, starting in Afghanistan with Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda group and its supporters, the Taliban. Even if the Americans get rid of Osama bin Laden today, there are thousands eagerly waiting to take his place. The war against terror, as the US labeled it, has put the spotlight on Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq and its nervous neighbor, Kuwait, which had been a victim of terrorism. The small Gulf state suddenly had a renewed relevance for the region's security. I think there is a legitimate reason to worry about what is happening inside Iraq and what conceivably could happen. Now, since the end of the war, the Iraqi regime, Saddam Hussein, have broken every promise they gave. They haven't uh, dismantled their uh, weapons manufacturing capability. They've obstructed inspections. They've inhibited inspections. They've actually stopped inspections. And so the concern that arises is what exactly is being manufactured there and what exactly might subsequently be done with it. The events of 9-11 have made the West question how Iraq might react and possibly get involved. In Kuwait, it's reawakened fears of vulnerability. Some of our oil installations were bombed. Uh, some of our oil tankers were attacked. So we, we've, we've suffered ourselves, and we know what terrorism means. Most dramatically, it's the events of August the 2nd, 1990, that Kuwaitis find hard to forget, as Iraqi forces poured over the border. For the next seven months, under Saddam Hussein's occupation, Kuwait transformed, both mentally and physically. The House of Martyrs is one of the few memorials to the invasion left standing. The destruction here came on the eve of Kuwait's liberation, as 19 members of Al Masila, a resistance group, took on overwhelming Iraqi forces. Miraculously, seven survived, some of them hiding in the rubble. The house and surroundings have been preserved as a symbol of Kuwait's resilience. In some sense, the war has not ended. Uh, perhaps there's a, a cessation of military hostilities. But in, in some sense, the, the struggle continues. I mean, for example, it continues for uh, the Kuwaiti uh, families who have not gotten a proper accounting for those people who disappeared or were taken prisoner uh, during uh, the Iraqi occupation. This will always remain unfinished business and cast a shadow over the celebration of freedom in February 1991.
It's a quiet scene that these rocks now preside over. Sand has blown over much of the military stain that trailed for miles 11 years ago as the Iraqi forces headed back to their border, driven to retreat by Western Allied forces led by the United States. Today, their military hardware and debris lies in a rusty graveyard surrounded by the unforgiving desert. A road that once carried much tourism and commerce between Kuwait and Iraq now lies like a tarmac tombstone between the neighbors. By the time the invaders were gone, more than 700 wells had been blown up. The raging infernos that lit up the skyline proved to be one of the biggest challenges facing the small oil-dependent state. Getting these under control required the world's top oil firefighters. At the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, known as KISA, the massive environmental harm following the invasion is still being assessed. Testing continues to check the recovery of the soil and plant life from the deadly airborne pollution that the oil fires created. Look at the sand. It's expanding. It's taking over. Look the latest satellite technology traces the progress of the thick oil lakes, mapping the continued risk to desert and marine ecology and people due to airborne oil pollution. 11 years after the crisis, we are facing a lot of problems combating that oil. The future environmental cost of the invasion and oil fires may have yet to reveal itself. But for now, Kuwait has fought hard to rebuild the infrastructure that snakes its way through the desert, carrying the black gold that brought this small nation its modern-day wealth. A huge public celebration commemorates the Emir's return to Kuwait in January 2002. 2001 had been a difficult year for the ruling family, as the head of state extended his stay in a London hospital. His arrival from the UK was marked with relief for those wondering how the balance of power in this oil-rich Gulf nation might shift. Power is a political balancing act in Kuwait. The umbrella of democracy and a strict constitution implemented in 1961 cover all of those in power. That's to say the ruling family, a handful of wealthy merchant families, and a growing number of independent power brokers. But there's still a long way to go, according to those who want something closer to a Western-style democracy. I think uh, we are still developing socially. We have still uh, a tribal structure. We have uh, also religious uh, factions. Uh, so it's not the party system which is predominant. It's mostly these uh, social relationships, tribe, family, social, uh, religious faction, which is of course not, uh, not what you would like to have in a full democracy based on issues, on ideas, on programs. We haven't reached fully that. Tradition guides Kuwait's political ideology in the form of diwaniyas, or open houses, which also maintain the bastion of male rule. Although the gatherings appear largely informal, they're the source of much backdoor policy making. More than three centuries ago, as Kuwait became a thriving trade center, the Waniers served as regular gatherings for merchants to do business and discuss strategies in an informal manner. The Waniers also served to bring members of the ruling family together regularly, keeping the bonds between them stronger. <coughs> Nowadays, the Waniers also act as political clubs where like-minded individuals can find support for one another's ideas. Hello? Hello. Young people are encouraged to keep up this tradition of gathering. And Diwaniyas are also a place where East and West can meet technologically, if not always ideologically. Uh, we still don't have political parties. We still don't have the institutions. I think the consensus among the people of Kuwait is democratic. but with lots of different, probably in some cases, divert, diverted ways of, of understanding democracies. And that is what we, in, the, in the, what we call the liberal movement, try to understand democracy in its, in its real sense. Successful businessmen like Al Mutawa find themselves frustrated at the interpretation of democracy in Kuwait. Parliamentary representation is mostly by independent candidates, some of whom band together for common interests. As mentioned, political parties don't exist, only political movements and coalitions including independents. Kuwait is a, a democratic uh, country, 
and they believe very strongly in the right of freedom of speech, and they exercise it well uh, and uh, uh, often without hesitation. This often leads to a lot of debate and a lot of different opinions blocking true progress in a nation that totals 2.2 million. As it is, the voter base in Kuwait is very low, around 15% out of 800,000 Kuwaiti citizens. This is because the voting age is 21, and those in the military are not allowed to vote. It's important to note that women are also excluded. That's not to say they don't know how to vote. At Kuwait University, the female students seem to play the most active role when it comes to college politics, and they seem to have many of the young men on their side. I support a woman's right to vote and her right to be a member of parliament. But there's a little uncertainty among the women themselves when it comes to whether or not women should run for parliament. Women should vote, but they should not be candidates. The best thing is if this comes in step by step, that's to say one step at a time. The obstacles we face are to do with tradition, not religion. Because many Islamic nations and Arab countries observe political rights for women, and women have reached senior posts, even becoming prime minister. So in Kuwait, we can't have our own interpretation of Islam, which restricts women's rights. The traditional desert nomads, known as Bedouins, are arguably the most wary faction. Women voting, this is not for the Arabs. A woman being in the cabinet, also not for us. At the end of the day, it's in the government's hands. I do not make the decisions. I will always consider in Kuwait that the vote is a family vote, not, not man vote and right woman vote. For example, my, me and my uh, for example, I vote for all the, my family, even the children. Ironically, Islam is very firm about giving a woman her rights. For example, she's entitled to keep her finances independent from her husband's. Kuwait's also considered quite liberal, so the parliamentary stance on the women's vote seemed a little out of place. We accept the result because we accept democracy, but we hope that things will change because we were really disappointed by there being only three votes against us and by those whom we didn't expect to vote against women's rights. But there's a view among parts of Kuwaiti society that fundamental Islam is growing stronger and that liberally minded members of parliament face something of a challenge from the fundamentalists. This is a game played by the government to cover up sensitive issues, so they like to keep the masses busy with issues like women's rights, which is a pure Western idea, which has no roots in our religion or culture. Tradition and culture in the Islamic world is very strong. The ever-present chessboard scene of black and white robes confirms that. But even those who cling to their cultural upbringing also quietly hope for change. Despite all the uh, disappointments uh, and all the uh, attempts to uh, amend such laws who are, who, which are discriminating against women, still we believe uh, in that the future will bring good uh, things for women and uh, will bring uh, equality and justice to women. In the meantime, it's still something of a man's world in Kuwait, where debate is a national pastime in all corners of society, in all sorts of places. How secure is democracy? Of course, uh, it, there was some differences domestically with the ruling family, but I think after 1990, probably would ha had overcome that. You don't ever see that being overturned, it being changed? Oh, we don't think so, we hope not. <laughs> Of course, the media is influencing us 100%. From the internet, we, we knew how to fight and how to ask for our rights. There's still some people here that don't use the internet on a regular daily basis. But in a lot of ways, it is advancing you know, knowledge and uh, common knowledge uh, throughout the society. As these students suggest, like elsewhere in the world, the internet is helping the free flow of information here. But so far in Kuwait, it's in its early years, in both ease of availability and uptake. Arabic language on the net is still limited, 
and access to high-speed connections is only gradually occurring. The usage of internet is still limited here. A lot of people use the internet, but uh, they still go for the newspaper. Perhaps what is changing the political and social face of Kuwait is the impact that freedom of expression is having, especially through Kuwait's own media. As daylight reluctantly gives way, the printing presses chug into action. Newspapers are independent in Kuwait and lively in their coverage of events with only a few boundaries. Frankly, compared to the, Mid the Gulf and the Middle East, I would say we have good amount of freedom. I can't compare to the West, but the freedom of press in particular is much closer to what the West has compared to the Middle East. I would even say that Kuwait, as a democratic uh, country today, the freedom of press is the thing most noticed here. Uh, I feel the press has more freedom, even, even more than the uh, parliament. Let's be frank here. We have what we call ceilings or red lines, which we cannot cross by law. Things like religion, you can't go deep into saying things wrong about religion. The emir, the head of state only. Other than that, we have uh, full freedom to express our views. That's the law. The problem here, like everywhere, I mean, uh, nobody trusts the government media. They are trusting the private media. And now we have first to take the trust of the people back. We have to show that we are really serious to give a freedom for our information mm -hmm. and uh, to show them we are uh, continuing with the latest technology. I think this is our first step. But human nature is human nature everywhere, and tabloid stuff sells. It sells well. I also noticed that when it comes to gossip, sex, private life, you expect that lower or less educated people, lower grade people, uh, gets more interested in such stories. From my experience for the last six years, it's the intellectuals, it's the politicians, it's the big shots in the country who will call you quietly, who is this, who is that, uh, give me the details and stuff like that. Uh, they enjoy it. Television is another matter altogether. Kuwait TV is entirely run by the government, falling under the control of the Ministry of Information. To a Western viewer, much of the content would seem inadequate, especially as far as news is concerned. This certainly limits its appeal to Kuwaitis, who are generally well-traveled and highly educated, despite their historic roots and traditions. Satellite TV is widespread, even in the most unexpected places and the government's aware it brings in what it considers both good and bad content. I think we don't have to control anything. We have to give the, the both opinion. We have to give the both side of each information. But sometimes if it's the national uh, interest uh, or the unity of the society, I think we have to ask, not to control. This suggestion of responsible journalism is certainly one that will have to take hold if the information minister's ambitious plans come to light. A daily ritual in a Muslim nation. The Friday noon prayer, the busiest of the week, often draws up to 4,000 worshippers. Following the September the 11th attacks on the US, the authorities in Kuwait were careful to make sure that prayer gatherings, large and small, were not a chance for extremists to spout hatred in the guise of religious doctrine, or for opportunists to create divisions within society. The danger will come when, for a political reason, some political parties will say all the traditional Muslims 
like Osama bin Laden. But optimists believe that some good may come out of a desire to know more about Islam since the attacks. There is a very big misunderstanding in the Western uh, world toward Islam. And we believe that uh, that kind of uh, crime will uh, make people start to read about Islam to understand Islam very well. But what happened is not Islam. But that doesn't appease the more conservative Muslims. Anything that comes from the West has to be checked according to the Quran and the Sunnah, and what's compatible we take. Otherwise, it's rejected, whether the West likes it or not. Even beyond the more recent global debate on Islam and religious values, Kuwait, like many Muslim countries, has a younger population questioning more traditional approaches to Islam, both socially and politically. I think the Islamic movement is misrepresenting Islam as a religion. It's interpreting Islam for its own gain, unfortunately. Many of these young people travel abroad extensively, bringing back the experience of more liberal societies. Plus, their daily routine is peppered with symbols of a Western lifestyle. This might help to explain some of the caution they expressed about life under stricter Islamic rules. But is that caution enough to make them drift away from their religion and traditions? Not everyone thinks so. People of Kuwait are open, they travel everywhere, they mix with other cultures. So some people uh, may be affected. But uh, I think myself that this uh, in certain age, but after a while, most of them return back to the Islamic traditions. In some cases, the law intervenes. In 1995, Kuwait's parliament passed a law segregating sexes in schools and universities, which many people saw as a mistake. This type of pressure is applied by traditional extremists, and it's not realistic. If you separate it, you need more teachers, you need more space, you need more money, you need everything, and that would probably put more burden on the quality of education, and instead of improving it, you're, you're wrong. I think this is wrong. What's your view on uh, the law that separates men and women in education? Well, I am against that. I prefer that uh, men and women together. There are men everywhere. They can't separate us in streets or, you know, anywhere when you go out, like those shopping malls or so. So I find it really wrong to have us separated at college. Even some of those in the Islamic movement accept that in this small Muslim state, harmony is possible between religion and lifestyle. Kuwaiti society as a modern society and even also a conservative society. That means Kuwaiti people still believe in Islamic values, but in very modern way. But it's important to remember that not all Arabs and not all Kuwaitis are Muslims. When I go outside, they, they think that I am a Muslim, and uh, they are uh, surprised when they know that I am a Christian and a Kuwaiti, and I mean an Arab and a Kuwaiti. So it, is, it goes then, the, I'll try to uh, explain to them about Christianity in Kuwait and in, in the Arab world. So where does this put the relationship between Muslims in Kuwait and Christians here, who number around a quarter of a million? Actually, we are born in, in this country, so uh, and uh, our relations with the with the different parts of the of the society is very good. So uh, on in Christmas and in Easter they come and uh, are calling to us, and the same we do when they have uh, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. So we have good relations, and uh, we are considered part of this uh, society. Another point, in the Middle East, not all Christians are Arabs. The growing number of South Asian workers coming to Kuwait in the past decade has boosted the numbers of Christians here, particularly Catholics. Mass is oversubscribed in every language, from English to various Indian tongues, such as Konkani. 
The large social gathering after mass is important for these Indians, who despite their concerns for their economic future in Kuwait, appreciate the freedom of worship here. Being a Catholic, no problem. There is no issue. Catholics, Muslims, are all okay. They're not thought as separate. It's a free country, like, no, everyone is free, free to do anything, means as far as the rule and regulation are concerned. We believe all religions should have the right to worship, to believe. This is our constitution. Despite the freedoms that all religions have in Kuwait, there is one rule. Any effort to convert Muslims away from Islam is forbidden. The latest jets, and plenty of them. For Kuwait, the price of security is a high one, but it could never be too high in the wake of the Iraqi invasion. Security, security, security. Like security is a very important issue in the mind of government. Following September the 11th, there's also a fear of terrorist attacks from radicals within Kuwait. Roadblock checks have become more thorough. Recent years have also been spent making sure Kuwait's armed forces are up to scratch, just in case trouble from across the border arises. The Kuwaiti army now is totally different from what it was 11 years ago. Critics of the multinational force that drove Iraqi troops out of Kuwait in 1991 say the job was never completed, that perhaps the Allies failed in their mission. Allied leaders counter that removing Saddam Hussein from power was not the mission. It was specifically driving the Iraqis out of Kuwait. Did we do the right thing in 91? You bet we did. Uh, and people who, who criticize that are really off base. We did make two mistakes. One, not requiring him to come to Safwan and sign the surrender documents. It would have been better to do that. And secondly, letting him use his helicopters in the immediate aftermath of the war, which enabled him to reposition his forces and to put down uprisings uh, in the, by the Kurds in the north and the Shiites in the south. Since the September the 11th attacks, President George W. Bush has put Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq back in the spotlight repeatedly. Cynics say the continued presence of Saddam Hussein has given Western nations, in particular the United States, a reason to maintain a military foothold in the Gulf region. Kuwait's leaders see this from a positive perspective, one of support rather than intrusion by outsiders. No doubt, we have excellent relation with the West. It was like this before the invasion and after the liberation, this relationship has become stronger. Liberating Kuwait brought us closer to the West. They have very advanced political systems and we are aiming to reach their standard. Apart from aspiring to a Western political system, achieving Western military standards has been a priority for Kuwait's armed forces. A greater sense of security for the nation has come from more firepower and a state of readiness. We have the main battle tank, the best tank in the world. We have uh, the uh, high technology uh, uh, equipment. From 1990 until now, there is a lot of experience coming with the many uh, different armies. I think it's a little bit hard, but uh, we try to uh, protect our country as we can. As much as Kuwaiti patriotism grew after the invasion, and as much as people want to defend their nation, they've become closely knit and perhaps dependent on the Western forces based on Kuwaiti soil. And the US, for one, is not in any hurry to move out. There are lots of reasons why the United States wants to become in, or wants to be engaged uh, in the region. Obviously, uh, a, a good portion of our oil comes from the region. Uh, that's a strategic interest for the United States. The strategic value of Kuwait to Britain was a big factor in the UK pushing hard for involvement in the region following the Iraqi invasion. If Saddam Hussein had held on to Kuwait, it wasn't simply uh, the rape of that country that offended the West. It wasn't simply uh, his control suddenly of Kuwaiti oil as well. It was the dangerous strategic position that, would, that then opened up, that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis would then go straight down the Gulf. And that, of course, would have changed the face of the whole of the Middle East. 
So Western forces came into the region 11 years ago and seem firmly entrenched, most visibly the USA. That's baloney. We were, we were already entrenched in that region. We are the guarantor of security for all of the Gulf uh, Arab countries. And to what extent can Kuwait develop and flourish as a true democracy while it's tied so closely to a powerful and influential Western presence on its soil? How much does democracy have to stand aside to make way for security? We should not sacrifice democracy. Democracy is deeply rooted in Kuwaiti culture. We are trying to bring it up to date. I don't think the status of democracy will ever reach the point where we have to choose between democracy and security. Democracy is security. Kuwait is opening up. It's the dawn of a new attitude, as Kuwaitis want overseas brands and businesses to become established in their nation, so that even if Kuwait's small, it's considered international. We believe in free market, and we believe in globalization also, and uh, free economy. We believe that economy in Kuwait should be liberated from the government, and uh, we should be open to all the free market in this world. It's already clear that Western emblems sit side by side with Eastern traditions in Kuwait, even in the older shopping areas. Here, experience such as a modern multi-level shopping mall with all the latest stuff. <laughs> They look at people in, in other countries to know what's in style. It's really important to people here. In fact, it worries many traditionalists that the younger generation is a bit too ready to embrace all things Western. There's a change in Kuwait society, but for me it's a negative change. It's not positive. There are too many satellite channels bringing different cultures, and Islamic people are influenced by these channels, and I don't consider it a good change for Kuwait. Still, change is inevitable in a place where the population is a majority of outsiders. Kuwaitis form less than 40%, and Asian workers and other Arab nationals are largely responsible for the changing face of the small Gulf state. A Palestinian wedding, unlike a traditional Kuwaiti one, mixes men and women in a very Western style. Despite these steps towards change, many in society want to keep the proud Kuwaiti culture. We believe we can protect our society and we can uh, continue the modernization process. It's a carefree age these youngsters are enjoying, but it's a change in Kuwait in which they're growing up, where employment skills will hold greater value and cushy government jobs will be a thing of the past. The pyramid in Kuwait is upside down. 90 over 93, 94, whatever figure you want as close as that, of Kuwaiti people working with the government, and 93 to 94% of foreign labor working with the private sector. That's being changed already as Kuwaitis enter every sector of the workforce. That leaves these expat laborers at a crossroads. Their families at home in places like India and Bangladesh depend on the money they send back. But Kuwait's economy is counting more on the Kuwaitis now. I think Kuwaitis are not lazy when they're given the opportunity and, and, and the role to play. What the proof, of course, is during the occupation time, the whole society of Kuwait turned to be a, uh, a B-cell. And, 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 and everybody was working. The Kuwaitis were working as bakers, they were working as garbage collectors, they were working as carpenters, they were working as... They worked every single thing. But money talks, and Kuwait still has it, for now.
Realizing the limitations of wealth through oil, Kuwait has actively been pouring money into investments and lessening its dependency on the black gold.